Winged Nation presents, presented by Driving DRF Racing Oils. You know when you can be identified with one word, one name, you are a legend. There's Elvis, there's Cher, there's Madonna, and in Northeast Dirt Modified Racing, there's Pouchy. Yeah, Billy Pouch, a legend, tearing up the dirt tracks in the Northeast. He's a member of the Northeast Dirt Modified Hall of Fame with more than 600 career wins in a career that not only featured a lot of success in modifieds, but also a ton of success in records in sprint car racing. During World Finals in Charlotte, we took Pouchy and sat him down at the NASCAR Hall of Fame with NASCAR Hall of Famers Ray Evernham and Tony Stewart. Aaron Evernham and myself joined the conversation in a program called Wing Nation Dryden Legends. And what a story session we had with Billy Pouch. With thousands of laps long, Dryden's DRF racing oils were built and proven on the track. And now they're ready for your race engine. DRF is engineered exclusively for high horsepower racing engines that require maximum performance against the toughest competition. And DRF racing and break-in oils are built with competition grade ZDDP to protect critical engine components while boasting improved torque and horsepower and superior temperature reduction. To get DRF in your engine, go to drfracing.com or call 1-877-DRY-D. And now here's story time with Billy Pouch. This guy, when we talk about legends, when we talk about superstars, he is a member of the uh, Northeast Dirt Modified Hall of Fame, and he has so many, uh, just so many great moments in modified racing, so many great moments in sprint car racing. Shoot, I saw him win, tr I saw him run truck races as well. So, uh, Ray, you got your buddy Pouchy on the stage with you. Take it away. I do, and I wanna, I just wanna clarify this. I wanna be nice to him now because when we start, I'm gonna roll into him pretty hard. But uh, Billy and I have been friends since 1977, and uh, we've done a lot of things together. And I can tell you that throughout his career, I've watched him do things that you dream about as a race car driver. You know, I was trying to figure out the other day because he doesn't know how many cars different cars he's driven. He doesn't know exact wins and championships and all that. I think that's what Mandy's doing for him. But, you know, from three quarter midgets to full midgets to sprints <laughs> to late models to modifieds to sportsmen, and I mean every rule package you could ever imagine in a modified. Sprint cars, as I said, wing, non-wing, 360s, 410s, dirt, and then pavement modifieds. NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series. He won the biggest pavement modified race that we have, the race of, of champions, ha, is the all-time feature winner at several different tracks in the Northeast. You know, his career has been amazing and he's just always been eh, about it. You know, that's just his his job. So that's as nice as I'm gonna that's as nice as I'm gonna be to you. But did it leak did, did you ever figure out how many races and championships you've won yet or not? I had Mandy look it up this morning. Mandy looked it up? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I like I said, I don't keep track of it. And <laughs> it's they're all numbers, you know. It's like your age, it's a number, you know, it's how you feel and how many wins you got. I, I don't want to get stuck on any numbers like some guys do that. I just keep keep going, try to win. And you won how many this year? Uh six. Six. And yeah. another championship. And another championship, yeah. Yeah, but it was pretty cool. We did it at a at a track, Bridgeport Speedway, and they they they've got a quarter mile, they've got a three eighths mile, and they got a five eighths mile, and uh, we had to run half the races, six or so, on the on the small three eighths, and we won three there. We won three on the big track, and we're always looking for promotional deals to try to bring people in to watch the race and stuff. And I said, man, we got three tracks here, and Tony's Tony come to my thought, you know when he was talking about Talladega's interview there <laughs> about taping off the cars and running maybe half of them one clockwise and there half of them counterclockwise. Yeah. That's a classic. I love that story. And I'm thinking, here we got three tracks. Why don't we do that? We can run a 30 lap or 10 laps on each track. You know, wouldn't that be neat? The only place we'd be a little busy is on the front stretch where they overall, all overlap. <laughs> Who's going to what turn and on what track, you know? But I thought that would be really, really cool to bring fans in. But nobody agreed with I like with the way me. he's thinking. I like the way he's thinking here. 
Have you guys run together? We have. Normally, it's typical Terry McCarl thing. Every time I ran against him, I saw the back of his car. I never even. I don't. I have no idea what the front of his cars look like because unless you see them in pictures. But uh, we, I'm always. We, we still talk because he hasn't turned a helmet at me. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's still early. Yeah. I still got. I still well, got a good arm. Still racing, so. But but I've always looked at Billy as like. He's like the Waylon Jennings of dirt track racing. It's like, he's just kind of the guy that just sits there. And I remember the days when he used to have the cigarette. He just kind of was just cool and chilled out. And he'd go out there and just whip your ass on the racetrack. And then still look just like that after he gets out of there, fire another one up. He's sitting there, cool as could be. He's like, this is just what he does every day, all day, every day. Well, you know, me and Billy actually raced together uh, a good bit. He used to try and give me advice. I, you know, I didn't listen to him because we were racing Bateman. At, at that time, but uh, we had a lot of fun racing around at Flemington. But the question I've always wanted to ask you, and I don't think we've ever really talked about this, what was it like to go around Syracuse at 150 miles Oh my God, miles absolutely. I get, we in got a sprint it. car. In a sprint car. Well, I'm sure Tony can answer that question. Uh -huh. It's like running Daytona. No, it, no, no. It, it, it's me. not that bad when you're going in the right direction, <laughs> but when you go in the wrong direction, it gets your attention pretty quick because the car starts hover, hovering over the ground and stuff. But I, I think the year, I think the year before I, I, I won Syracuse, I started on the front row, went down into one, everybody's got to beat him into one, gotta, that's the race, got to beat him into one. Well, that ain't the whole race. The race is a lot more than that, but it helps to beat him into one. So I beat him into one, and I went down in there, and it was slick, and the car winged down so hard, the right rear was off the ground, the right front was off the ground, and it turned like this. And I'm, I turned to the left and looked at the front stretch of all the cars behind me coming. I said, this is it. I'm going to die right here. <laughs> and somehow I got it turned and straightened out and, you know, made a few more laps. So I finally spun it out and backed it in the wall. But it was one of them, I'm going to die. Yeah, that's that's why you Scary. will not see me ever. Sir, well, Syracuse <laughs> isn't around anymore, but you would never see me on a dirt mile in a wing sprint car. I mean, I've ran, the, the top speed I ever ran in an Indy car was 250 at the end of the back stretch at turn three at Indy. We run 212 at Michigan going into turn one. I, I, I want nothing to do with running a 410 wing sprint car they're, on a mile dirt track. They're really not meant for a mile, you know. Right. I mean, you're, you're, the wings are light in there. I've had the wing blow up, I've had the wing blow down. I'm going down the back stretch there, I don't know, 100 some mile an hour, and all of a sudden the wing front broke and the wing stood straight up and just put me in a wheelie going 100 some mile an hour. And I was like, ah, here we're gonna die again. And finally it comes down and, and I'm like, you know, you crap your pants, you know, and, <laughs> yeah, and I get and in there, so. and Lucas Wolf was behind me, goes, I don't know if it scared you, but it sure scared me watching it, you know? I, I can tell you this, it's making me want to climb off of this, curl up in the fetal position on here, and wait till the show's over and move, so. You know, you, you won't say that, you tell them about how scared you are, but neither one of you lift off the gas. You're not well, thinking about that while you're in the car. It's because we, we got to pay rent. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, don't confuse bravery with stupidity either, by the way. <laughs> so. You know, we talked about all those cars you raced. I mean, all those cars you raced. And, uh, you know, out of that, can you think, what was your favorite car? And what was your least favorite car to drive? Favorite, Type of car. Favorite car? Everybody asks me, well, what do you like better? Sprints, modifieds, this, this, and that. My, my answer is always, what's ever fast and up front. That's the car I like. <laughs> when you're in the back struggle, and <laughs> you don't want to be in that car, but... I thought sprint cars were the most demanding thing I ever drove until I jumped in a late model. And it's like, man, them things, I don't know what they do now, but they're, they're jacked up, carrying the left side, and I can't see out the door, you know, and I'm, I'm getting banged into and stuff, and they come in, and, what, what do we need to change this? And you need to put a window on the left side so <laughs> I can see these guys, because I go in there and it goes up, I see nobody, you know? It's like, we need a window here so we can see these guys racing next to me, you know? And, it, it, and they, you hit a hole in that rear steer. They're going this way. They're going that way. It maybe ain't as fast as a sprint, but it keeps you up on your on your toes. You know. <laughs> I remember one of the first dirt layman races I ran was in I think Hills Corner, Wisconsin. I just bought a car, and a, and a guy that I became friends with out, that lived by me would put my car in his hauler, and, and he'd help me out. And I remember going hot, running hot laps, and I was really, really tight, and did exactly what you said. That was when the left fronts used to carry. And I remember I was headed to the flag stand off of four, so I had to lift. When I lifted, literally, my nose came down right behind this guy's spoiler like this. I had no idea that guy was even there. He drove by me underneath the bottom side and came up in front of me. Thank God I lifted. I don't know if I was going to drive into him, but it scared the out of me. 
when all of a sudden you get out of the gas and, and this guy's back of his car is here and the nose comes down like this. It was like I was cutting the end of the, the back of his car. And I came in and he goes, what do we need to do? I said, we need to get somebody else that can drive this thing first of all, because I said, I, I, I just scared myself. But they are, that, that's the thing that's crazy about the, the late models is the way the geometry is now. I mean, you look at the noses on these cars when they're sitting still, and they look like they're broke, like somebody wrecked it and it's all twisted up. Twist up. But then the car goes in the corner and that nose sits flat, just like a cup car, just like an Xfinity yeah. car or truck. And that's the way they got them designed now, but they, they've learned all that geometry and roll steer and how to get the rear of the car up to where it's getting the it's air on the air. spoiler. Yeah. How about the right fronts with me? Those things are science projects I'm, I'm now. I'm pollution. I'm looking at it. The race before I raced, I'm like, the right front's broke. It's laid over like this coming out of the turn, but they're set up the camera in so much that it, it, it looks like it's broke, you know? But it's some weird stuff going on with them things. And man, you need to be a rocket scientist for them, you know? That's why the sprint car is probably a little bit more simple and flat feeling. But the other thing that you adapted to that has always amazed me is you won the race of champions, the biggest pavement modified race that was held in the Northeast, and you jump into somebody's backup car, and I guess came through, I guess the last 20, 25 laps of that race, if I'm right, you've made a charge through the the field and ended up winning one of the biggest one of the biggest pavement races that we have. What how did that come about? You just I would give you a backup car, I'm gonna go win the biggest race you guys run? No, I was I was I was at home that morning and I'm taking a shower, so my wife hollers upstairs, hey fly me to the speedways on the on the phone and they wanna know if you want to drive Mary Flory's car. I'm like and I knew it was race champions weekend, you know, I'd had no ride or nothing. I was it was the same weekend as Eastern States. I'd never ride for air, so I said, "Hell yeah, I'll come do it." You know, so I go up there, I warm the thing up, and then, and uh, I didn't know them guys. I haven't run asphalt all year. I was the first time I, I Flemington paved, and I did it for a year or so, and almost killed myself two, three times. I said, "I got to get out of this. <laughs> I got to go do something different." You know, say so for me, I come home and. Uh, back then, I had a little longer hair, and I'm like, "What the hell? You chewing gum in my hair?" It was it was the rubber from all the tires <laughs> and stuff. I'm like, "This is the you get it." I come home, I was depressed, and I just asphalt when you run dirt. It just it's different, you know. And I just didn't take to it real well at first, but I knew that was a really good car. I knew the guy the guy car could win race. I think who was supposed to drive it that day? Doug Everett or something? And he didn't uh -huh. show up. And they called me. I said, "Hell yeah, I'll drive." So I go up there, warm it up, and got up to speed pretty quick. And I, I think I don't know if we time trialed or what, but I ended up there. Remember that dip getting in the three? I hit it, and the car spun. I crashed. I was like, "Oh boy, this is great." So I said, "I don't live far from here. Bring it down to my shop." We straightened it out. Went back the next day, ran the Concy last chance race, qualified, started 43rd, and uh, you know we're racing 250 laps. It was a long ass yeah. race in Flemington was like a big circle and it would wear your ass out. I mean, you used to have to put your head up against the thing. I used to take a, a seat belt and strap my leg to the roll cage. So, uh, two or three cigarettes? Yeah, right I, I didn't have time <laughs> David for that. David Pearson Jr. Yeah. So, I'm out there, you know, and I was in pretty good shape back then, you know, for the shape I was in, smoking and all, <laughs> but whatever. And uh, we got running a race, got running a race, and it got up about 200 lap mark, and I'm like, I, I can't get no more out of it. The car's too tight, I'm pushing them. I just couldn't get it to turn no more. So he said, next caution, pit. So it was right after 200 to something. I pitted, come in, they put a new right front on it, made a change, I went back out, and boy, I'm coming through the field, coming through the field. And I got up to, I think it was five to go, it was fifth. And I think it was Reggie Ruggiero, uh, one of the Fuller brothers. Fuller, one of the Fullers, yeah. And Tony Cisco, yeah. they were second, third, and fourth, I was fifth. And I come rolling into three, you know how Flemington you roll up and then you roll back down coming out. And I rolled by all of them but Reggie, he started to come back down. We bumped a little bit. He wasn't too happy about it, but I got by him and Mike Unisco was leading the race and he was out of sight and he broke a coil over or something. And I caught him, I think I caught him coming around for the white flag and passed him. I didn't even know, I didn't know who was leading or what, you know. And, and I come around, took the checker flag, and they're like, you won. I'm like, oh, shit, yeah, really? I won? <laughs> I'm like, I had no idea, you know? So it, it was pretty cool. I mean, to be fifth with five to go and come through and win a race, that, that's, it's cool, you know? You guys can especially relate Especially when to you're that. home without a rock. Yeah, and then, then they're all asphalt people. They don't know me, you know? I was like, Billy who? Billy Pouch? Who's he? You know? It's like, 
all them asphalt people never knew me, you know. And back then, I, I, after that, I started running little asphalt. I would run for Dick Barney at Flemington. I'd run Williams Grove Friday night in a sprint car. I'd go to Flemington, run an asphalt car, Saturday, pancake car, and then go to Penn National on Sunday and run a dirt modified. It was like three different things, you know, but it, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, you're, just, you're the same way. You just wanted to run anything, you know. As long as it was fast up front, I'm in. Does anybody other than me realize that on all those names that he pronounced that there wasn't a Smith or Jones in that field there. <laughs> That's New York you, modified. You, you, you go up yeah, north, I mean, there's, yeah. I, I think there's a minimum requirement that there has to be 15 letters in your last name. With seven the of them being driving. vowels. Right. Yeah. yeah. But when I won Syracuse with a sprint car, it's like you're a national celebrity. You, you beat the world of outlaws. Well, yeah, because you're insane. You set, you, set, you set a new track record. You let every lap. We even got best appearing car, you know. So I was like, I had people call me, hey, come drive my car. I went to to uh, Tucson, Arizona, run a late model. I went to, to the Copper World, run a midget. And a, a, I think it was a champ car that Parnelli Jones drove with a big old wraparound thing. And it was like, the midget, I'm out there, I blew two motors up. You drove midgets there. That's hairy. You get down to turn a little midget on a mile there, and it's moving around, it's moving around. I'm chasing, I'm chasing it. Boom, motor blows up, come in. They put another one in. Go out there, chasing it, chasing one. Boom, it blows up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm done with that. They're out of motors. Yeah. So Coney comes over. So Coney comes over. Hey, I got another motor. Shh, 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 get, <laughs> get out of here. I don't want to be doing this. This ain't me, you know? And I watch the race, and they're all out there doing that. It's like, that's it, you know? But that's hairy to midget. You're talking about a sprint car on a mile. What about a midget? Yeah, but if you think that's scary, you should be in a V6 Silver Crown car and have Jack Hoddenshield go by you on the dog leg on the back stretch <laughs> sideways and pass you, and you go, He's not going to make, oh, he did make the corner, I'll be damned. He would do that, he didn't, no, that's what I kept thinking. I'm like, there's no way this guy's going to make it to the end of the race, and I'll be damned if he ran third and I ran fourth. I'm like, this guy can't have any tire left. But, I mean, he'd run through the dog lake sideways. I'm like, this is, this is going to be big at the end of the, I, I, how he made it through, A, how he made it through three every lap was a miracle. How he had a tire on was amazing, but he'd sit there, he was fearless around there, but I, it was, the, the miles were, when you ran, whether it was Springfield, the coin, uh, with Silver Crown of Midgets or, or Phoenix, oh man, it, it would definitely get your attention for sure. He, 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 he was behind me at Syracuse there when I was, and he crashed out trying to pass me at the inside berm. But if I had a mirror, he probably would have scared me to death. That's watching, what I was thinking. You know? The best like, thing that could happen is you didn't see him back Yeah, then. I know. It's like a lot of times you don't see that stuff. Man, if you see <laughs> it, it would scare you. This guy's going to take me with him, you know? Uh, it's good to know that that guy's get that stuff impresses you guys with other guys because it's surely impressive for us to watch from the from the grandstands but you know we just as we're winding down wanted to just touch on one thing we we, we talked about the generations you know everybody here with the you know with, with bobby allen and, and then with terry and blaney and you've got billy jr who's had a heck of a year 10 wins in a championship and then you got bp3 i mean mm -hmm. looking mm -hmm. down are you you know you your dad roy was legendary up where where we were then you now billy and, and, and i guess bp3 i guess we kind of nicknamed him bp3 because yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he doesn't want to be the fourth uh he shows interest in racing you know i got a little go-kart that i tow him around in that it's got a roll cage and stuff that i built for a little bit how fast billy. do you tow him well <laughs> <laughs> we think about it. he's only three years old we don't want to get, scare him yet you know but uh he, he likes it he, he's in the race my whole family has always been in the race. You know, my father raced, my mother did powder puffs, and I raced Billy races, Mandy's involved with it. You know, she raced one powder puffs, and you know, she's she's more the famous one now. You know, I walk around with her to ask for her autograph, and my, not mine no more, you know? It's like, oh, you're Mandy Pouch? Who's this guy with you? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it, it's cool I, it, to have your family involved in it, you know? And, 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 and she does a lot for, the sport with her videos and stuff trying to promote it which you know social media a lot of times trying to tear down the sport and it takes some people to try to build it up and show the positive aspects of it well we appreciate you appreciate you more not getting into all those stories from the old methane benefits and stuff especially uh, <laughs> with uh, my wife being here we might have we might have consumed a beverage or two and might have i don't think we ever really gotten a lot of trouble but we've probably gotten <laughs> a little bit of trouble. Remember the time we went to the first BRI show down in the Yeah, Nashville? I remember that. It was really good to have. <laughs>
<laughs> if any story that starts with the remember that that year at the PRI show, it never ends well. Everybody yeah. remembers starting something at the PRI show. They don't normally remember finishing. Yeah, no, that was a uh, yeah. <laughs> Postman, got anything? I, I'm kind of like uh, we might let you we might let you hang there for a little bit. Now, how about it for Billy Pouch, ladies and gentlemen? I'm telling you, that's, that's pretty cool stuff. It is neat. You know, I, I grew up knowing who Billy Pouch was, but to hear the amount of cars, the amount of success he had, and to hear him talk about it like it's no big deal. Like, my wing blew up going 150 down the back stretch of Syracuse. Like, it, it's insane. It was. I that's, enjoyed listening to all of them. That's it's been a difference great. between men and boys right there. That <laughs> yeah. is for sure. It is absolutely amazing. It absolutely is. Okay. Um, so you're not you're not looking at a wing sprint car on a mile track anytime soon. You weren't before, God, no. and after this, you're yeah. no, definitely not. I, I remember seeing videos of it, yeah. and uh, it, it yeah, I got, I have no interest in that. It's unreal to me. It is unreal. It's unreal what they do on the the, the three eighths mile, the four tenths, the half miles. It really truly is. All right, so we started this with uh, Ray and Aaron, yeah. and we talked about we talked about. Um, Ray's 305 career. I feel career. like I should move over to this seat and give her this seat. No, you should stay in the middle. We're going to need... If you referee. think I'm going to referee this, you're wrong, sister. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you forget I'm an I mean, instigator in scenarios like asked. this. Come on now. <laughs> so we're racing 305s at Carolina Speedway. 360s. 360s at Carolina Speedway. Uh, who, wants, who wants to start? Well, wait a minute. Should we have McCarl come up here? Because there's three sides. There's going to be your side, his side, and I think we should... <laughs> Probably let McCarl have his yeah. side of this because I like his side most of the time. Yeah, because Terry would never instigate anything never here. So. <laughs> and it's a, it's a side that's entertaining. I think yes, it, it is. It'd be a good blend. I, I, it's not, the floor ladies is first. They're, they're both right, sitting so here in their heads she, thinking whoever goes last speed, is yeah. probably going to get this. Yeah, more, yeah, yeah. More we're going to need therapy after this. But yeah. So um, 2011, I believe it was. Ray had been racing 305s, and as we know, it was a very successful 305, multiple time winner in the 305s. So I'm running 360s. We're going to run the USCS race at Carolina. And Ray, months before, says, I want to race it. I'm like, no, no, no. We, we cannot race against each other. We literally cannot play a board game together. Like, we tried Scrabble one time, and it got so ugly. We go for a run, and, like, the last quarter mile, both of us start picking it up. Like, we literally, everything's competition. So, of course, after some time, he, he gets his way. Here we go. We're off to Carolina Speedway, and I'm not happy about it because Ray at the racetrack, as media and, and MRN, you know what he was like back in the day at the racetrack. Like, Even Bobby always, Allen. I mean, yeah, I can't believe Yeah, you blew off go. Bobby Allen cool. all those times. You fought with Tony. I mean, well, you've got a reputation for being tough we at the racetrack. We didn't actually fight. Your crews did. No, we, we, we yeah, almost we, did. we were we, smart we, enough to get yeah. out, of, out of their yeah. way and yeah. let them go they, at they, it. The crews were fighting. We, he and I had a pretty heated conversation for about an hour in a, in a motor coach, and then it calmed down, and we were drinking beer, I think, because it was raining. Well, and we were thirsty. And thirsty, we, yeah. we figured if we, were lot, if, we figured if we just stopped arguing, we could get to the beer drinking a lot sooner. <laughs> All right, so back to Carolina. Um, USCS race, I, Again, dead set against race against him. I just thought there's nothing good is going to come of this. We're going to be fighting. He's not going to be worried about my car. And I, was, it's just, I just thought the whole thing was bad. So anyways, I'm running second, seven laps to go. And I end up passing Morgan Turpin, who we have on the show a lot, uh, another young female sprint car racer that's doing a really good job. And the track is dry as can be. I'm running right up against the fence. And the fence at Carolina Speedway is a Jersey barrier. That, that's it. So. Uh, I get the five to go, I now have the lead, and I see one lap car ahead of me. Like at the end of the straightaway, I'm like, shh, you're kidding me. It's Ray, and I'm catching him, and I'm catching him. So, I, as I take the checkered, he's getting the white flag. I'm right on his tail, like right on him. We go into turn one, and Ray's version of the story is that I gave him the bird. My version of the story is I really wasn't sure if he was going low or high, and I miscalculated my entry, and I went up and over and out of the racetrack. So now I have won the race. I am, there's a 20-foot drop back there, and it is pitch black. The race control doesn't even know I'm off the track. They're calling 98 to the scales, and I'm like, they have no idea. I am, I am, I'm back here. So I climb out of the car. I, had to, I literally had to use, like, my hands on roots to climb back up to the track. Ray can take over from here because he's, now looping around the track, he hears the radio, thinks I won. So he's trying to find me in victory lane, and I'm nowhere to be found. Oh, it's my turn to pick yeah. up? Yeah. 
Um, Get your version. Well, she definitely didn't want to race with me. I wanted to race a 360 that was going to be a problem. So that was my first 360 race. And all I wanted to do was get a top 10 and not turn over. Um, and uh, so we were uh, coming to, uh, I saw the white and the checker being put out. So I knew the leaders were on me. And I was like, all right, I just need to hold my, hold my line here. And Erin said she wasn't sure whether I was going high or low. <laughs> I can't tell you if I was sure of that myself at, you know, in my first 360 race. Um, but uh, when we crossed the, the line, I heard him say 98, 10. And I said, wow, she won this thing. And the caution lights come out. So I was going to pull around to go to, uh, to Victory Lane and get a picture taken with, with Aaron and the race car, and there's nobody there. So I thought, must have sent her to the scale. So I roll up the scales, there's nobody there but one of our crew members. And I said, uh, Danny, what, did she win this thing? And he said, yeah. I said, well, where's she at? And he said, in the woods. <laughs> I said, in the woods? He goes, yeah, you, you bumped her and she flew over the fence. And I'm thinking, oh my God, uh, this, this is exactly what she said. And here I've, I've flown around the parking lot and I didn't even feel it. I didn't even know that, um, that, that I hit her. So, but uh, long story short, she said she miscalculated. I think she was giving me the bird on the way by, like, yeah, I lapped your ass before we, you know, before we did this thing. But we had, uh, we have a picture of, at the shop with our others of Erin in Victory Lane covered with dirt and mud. Like, I think there's grass sticking out of her hair. And, no uh, car. No car. Just and, a checkered uh, th flag. So that is the car. And that is the car she qualified for the A-Main at Knoxville in uh, 2010. And it was a pristine car. Sent it out over the fence. It's pretty twisted up. We straightened it out and gave it back to her for, uh, for Christmas uh, last year. But um, I only got to run one more 360 race after that, and that was it. I was sent back to the 305. Career was done. Back then. <laughs> All right, I'll be the third one in this equation. I got to race with him in a late model at Eldora. I'm pretty sure he didn't know where he was going when you got there. <laughs> I was there at those because late we thought races. we we didn't know what sponsor was going to be on his car but after the first year we were trying to get him a wiper blade sponsor for that because he pretty much was like this back and forth oh, and i'm going to tell you spoilers. that he tore i off some owe spoilers. this guy so much for that i can't even right tell you, you. i do i paid for I all do. the crash cl you, crash clauses well, on those cars it. but what an amazing experience <laughs> for somebody like me who would love to have had the talent to been a real race driver, but worked with some of the greatest race car drivers in the world. And Tony gave me the opportunity to be on the racetrack with guys, you know, w w with, with him, with, with Jeff, with some of the indie guys, Kanan and, and whatnot. And I will tell you, I have had an experience that I will guarantee you nobody else in motorsports, <laughs> the motorsports world, ever had. I was three wide at Eldora with Red Farmer on the inside and Juan Pablo Montour on the outside. Now you tell me anybody else that's ever been in a combination like that. Red Farmer and Juan Pablo. I got Pablo. a better one. Not, tell me anybody that. that wants to be in that equation with you three. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say this, as much as you thought that was cool, we would love to be smart enough to be able to do what you've done on your side of the, of the wall and, and win the races and championships that you've won with the, the knowledge and talent you have to make those things go as fast as they go. So. Trust me, we're, we, it, the, the admiration goes both ways. Everybody wow. gets their stuff. But, so now, I need to invite you to come and drive the latest creation I built. Oh boy. You've been working on me for two years on this car. I know. I just wanted to see you drive it first to make sure nothing was gonna happen. <laughs> it's, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get you the road course. I'm in. I don't, have, okay. I don't race for points. And, man, I, once I got to 40, I feel like every year is a, like extended play on a video game. I didn't think I'd live this long. So. Are you 40? Me ish. <laughs> ish. How about it, everybody, for our hosts, for Dry Dean Wing Nation legends, Ray Everham, Tony Stewart, here joining us. Gentlemen, we appreciate you guys joining us here. With thousands of laps long, Dry Dean's DRF racing oils were built and proven on the track. And now they're ready for your race engine. DRF is engineered exclusively for high horsepower racing engines that require maximum performance against the toughest competition. And DRF racing and break-in oils are built with competition grade ZDDP to protect critical engine components while boasting improved torque and horsepower and superior temperature reduction. To get DRF in your engine, go to drfracing.com or call 1-877-DRY-D. As a modified fan from the Northeast, 
I grew up on Pouchy, and I knew some of the stories, but to hear him tell them and get into detail was absolutely amazing. That's one of those deals where little race fan Steve Post came out listening to those guys on the stage. We appreciate you joining us here this week for Wing Nation Presents, presented by Drydeen DRF Racing Oils. Winged Nation presents, presented by Driving DRF Racing Oils.